Margaret put up a courageous battle against her health issues for a lot of years, and she was able to do so in no small part because of the love and the care and the support that she received from y'all and so many others. And so the family wants to say thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for being present here today. This is the first uh, service that we've had at uh, the church, uh, first celebration of life service during the time of COVID. And so obviously things are a little different. And so there's a few housekeeping kinds of things to go over. One is uh, you have that mask on that's uh, making it hard for you to breathe. And we just ask you to keep that on throughout the service. And um, perhaps even stranger than wearing masks is that uh, at this kind of service, we're actually uh, asking people not to hug or to handshake, which seems, it kind of seems wrong, doesn't it, at a service uh, like this? Um, but the family does want you to know that that's their wish, but also that they do feel your love. And so you can communicate it through your eyes and your words. Um, at the end of the service, uh, we're going to ask that you um, go out this door, a different door than you came in, and the door will be open. If you're in the balcony, you can go out this door over here, and there will be a reception uh, that's just outside, and it'll be a chance to visit, and a chance to connect, and a chance to speak with uh, Margaret's family. And so I'll give you those instructions at the end of the service. Well, we're here today on this uh, fall afternoon for a few reasons. Uh, we've paused everything, put things on hold, to do a couple of important things. And that is we want to celebrate Margaret's life. We want to remember the life that she lived and, and hold it out as an utterly unique and beautiful life that God has given to us. Margaret was well loved. And every one of us has memories of Margaret that are unique to us. And we each have a unique relationship with her. She was a mother and a grandmother, a wife, a sister, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, a sister in Christ, and everybody here has precious memories of Margaret and her family. And so we pause this afternoon to take a minute and just remember um, a person who impacted our lives and is worth celebrating. And so you and I are the way we are in this world. We walk through this world. We see the world. We're deeply shaped by the people in our lives. And Margaret has shaped us. And so this is a good day to give thanks for her life. This is a good day to celebrate her life. But we don't just come to celebrate. We also come to comfort each other. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And so we are here to uh, put our arms around, metaphorically in this case, Joe and especially Jeffrey and Caitlin um, today and say that um, Margaret was important and... Um, that we feel your hurt and your loss has reached our lives and we're saddened like you're saddened. And that's what the family of God does when people are hurting. We comfort one another with the comfort God has given us. And we also gather today to, to say goodbye. Ceremonies are significant. They give us an opportunity to make a transition. Uh, it's a painful but important part of the process of moving forward. And so we depend on God's help for all of that. Uh, Hebrews 4 puts it like this, this high priest of ours understands our weakness for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God and there we will find and receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of life and death. You're present in our joy and in our pain and your creator and comforter. And we come here this afternoon to remember the precious life of your beloved daughter, Margaret. And we're here to celebrate the life that she enjoyed on this earth. And we thank you for the memories that are present in this room of time with her. We've been enriched by knowing her and through her we have seen you 
in her love, in her kindness, in her humor, in her compassion. And so this afternoon we commit her life and death to you, knowing that you're just and merciful and that we do not um, cease to exist at the grave, but that we have hope for heaven. And so we stand uh, this afternoon before the mystery of life and death, and we ask for your comfort and your presence as we do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the bulletin, uh, you have the order of service, and you also have the obituary. And I'd like to read it to you at this time. Margaret Sandra Murphy passed very peacefully and went to be with Jesus on September 28, 2020, with her family by her side. Margaret was born in 1960 to Robert and Audrey Wilson in Edmonton, Alberta. She was younger sister to her brother John Wilson. Margaret accepted Jesus as a teenager. She worked at Woodward's department store as she attended school and met Joe Murphy, her future husband, who also worked at Woodward's. They fell in love, and they married in June 1980. Margaret shortly after went to the University of Alberta Nursing School and worked at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton as an oncology nurse, faithfully serving many in the throes of cancer. Margaret underwent many procedures so that she could have a baby. And in 1989, Margaret and Joe were blessed when their son Jeffrey was born. In 1992, the family moved to Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, where they met and made many close friends to this day and enjoyed the small city northern culture. Margaret continued her nursing in surgical daycare at Stanton Yellowknife Regional Hospital. Their next move was to Regina, another hot spot in 1998. I think Joe wrote that with a wink. Margaret stayed at home from then on, focusing her time on looking after her two boys, husband Joe and son Jeff. Joe's job and family health concerns brought them to Calgary in 2002, where they made their home. Church, family, and Jeffrey sports were the main focuses at that time, and over the years, Margaret rarely missed one of Jeff's games. She was involved with the church prayer chain and made many trips to Edmonton to look after her mom and dad in their older years. There were many trailering holidays in the East Kootenays. Margaret and Joe purchased a second home in Fairmont Hot Springs, B.C. in 2012 and loved being in the valley at all times of the year. In 2015, Jeff and Caitlin had their first baby girl, Bentley, and in 2017, Taya. Margaret loved and cherished these two little treasures. It was apparent Margaret was struggling health-wise over the past 10 years or so. In 2014, she was diagnosed with both Addison's disease and myotonic dystrophy. While the Addison's was controlled through medication, her muscle weakness and pain from myotonic dystrophy became increasingly significant with many hospital visits, falls, and broken bones. Her fierce determination to come home and resume her life was always so evident. She was very courageous through her physical struggles. After fracturing her ankle in June 2020, Margaret spent most of the next four months in care. Margaret was a quiet person for the most part, but had a great sense of humor, love of people, a heart of generosity, and steadfast loyalty in faith, family, and friends. With two active boys, Joe and Jeff, to handle, she always handled herself with common sense, love, and compassion. Margaret is survived by her loving husband of 40 years, Joe, her son Jeffrey and his wife Caitlin, granddaughters Bentley and Taya, her sister-in-law Becky Wilson, mother-in-law Louise Murphy, brothers-in-law Michael and David, and six wonderful nieces and one nephew. She was predeceased by Mother Audrey, Father Robert, Brother John, and father-in-law Bill Murphy. And as we talked about the service, there were several scriptures uh, that um, the family knew were meaningful to Margaret. And so we're going to uh, ask various people from their family to read them. And we'll have some reflections from Margaret's friend Lynn and from her son Jeff. So I'll ask um, Katie to come up and read from Psalm 23.
<clears throat> a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you know much about tapestries? I don't, but several years back I was in Italy and I saw numerous tapestries. They all had several things in common. They were works of art, they were unique, and they took a great deal of time and effort to create. They were influenced by their surroundings, but particularly by the light. As the light changed, different colors uh, Blah, blah, blah. different colors faded and others intensified. Most of us, when looking at the tapestry, would recognize the basic theme of that tapestry, but each of us would then notice the nuances that spoke to us. I've long looked at each of our lives as a tapestry, a work of art in progress. The master weaver is God. God weaves a tapestry and produces you and I. While we are each created in God's image, we are uniquely created to be who we are. Each event in our lives affects our tapestry. As we sit here today, God is at work weaving and stitching a tapestry that cannot be replicated. That thought alone is amazing in this world when, uh, of technology when everything can be reproduced and, and replicated just in an instant. God gave us freedom of choice, hence individuality. Just as a tapestry consists of thousands of threads, millions of stitches, and a rainbow of colors, our lives and who we are becoming is shaped and shaded by each event that happens in our lives. Everyday interactions with our families, friends, and strangers adds depth to our tapestry. There are moments when that weave may become thick and, and full, or it may become stretched and thin, dark and stormy colors or bright and light colors, all a part of who we are becoming. So what does this have to do with our reason for being here today? Margaret's tapestry is complete. And just like the tapestries in Italy that are fully appreciated and valued when complete, we're here to appreciate Margaret's tapestry of life. Each of us played a part in Margaret's tapestry, and in turn, she left a stitch or row upon row in our tapestries. Margaret asked me to be part of today's celebration of her life, and I felt inadequate. Sorry, quick drink. <laughs> I was not the best of friends day in and day out. Surely there's someone else that would be better qualified. But she asked me, and this was one or another argument that I would not win. <laughs> when I sat with her on Sunday, she told me not to cry. A final word for me from Margaret. I was crying at the time and so I'm not sure if she meant just then, or was that my instruction for today? Either way, my answer remains the same. I will miss my friend.
and I can't help but cry. That's the way God wired me. Okay. Margaret and I have no clear idea of when we met or when we started hanging out together. We both agree it was at King Edward Park Church in Edmonton. Joe reminded me yesterday that I was leading a Bible study at Marlene Stodgill's place and they attended. Margaret and I spent time organizing the church's library, which took us a lot of days and a lot of chatting to accomplish the task. And if you know Margaret or me, yes, you can figure that one out. Uh, Joe and Margaret hosted a barbecue at their house for our small group one time. And uh, there was a football that was being tossed around the backyard and it went over the fence. And Dan Cameron, who was our then pastor, flew over the fence and, and followed it and got it back. I'm not sure that Margaret thought that was the best way to get to meet the neighbors. Apparently that barbecue was the first time that Margaret knew Lee and I were dating. Next thing, Lee and I were married and Margaret never stopped telling me that I waited until they moved to Yellowknife before we got married so that she couldn't come to the wedding. Life was all about Margaret. <laughs> um, we made trips to Yellowknife and stayed at the Murphy house. On one particular visit, Margaret volunteered to look after a then four month old Ethan while we went for a hike. We took a five-year-old Jeff with us. We had a great time climbing the hills and cliffs in Yellowknife. I seem to remember a large rock that had a trail up it, and we took Jeff with us. We took a picture of him sitting on the precipice with his legs dangling over. It was a grand adventure. When Margaret caught a glimpse of that picture, we were in severe trouble, let me tell you. At one point, Lee and I were living in Winnipeg and we had, th we had thoughts that we were going to be in closer proximity because the Murphs were again on the move and they were headed to Regina. At the same time, Lee got a transfer to Oakville, so we're far apart again. No problem though, we holidayed in Cuba and Dominican Republic with them and we have fond memories of the wives, Margaret, signing up the husbands to help with setup for the evening show at the resort. Turns out our men were somehow entered in a Mr. Tarzan contest. And one of them won. You'll have to check with the gentleman after the service. The Murphs moved back to Calgary and the Woods returned to Edmonton. We visited back and forth for years and each time it felt like no time had passed. Margaret took a fall at my house and broke her wrist and swore she would never visit again. And I said she would, and she did. All this to say that Margaret and I have been there for each other through thick and sometimes pretty thin times, and yet we hung together. God knew we needed each other. and that each of our tapestries would be incomplete without the other. Some of the brighter spots in my tapestry involved Margaret, as did some of the deeper, darker colors that provided definition and clarity of my beliefs. I will miss my friend. Sorry, but I delight in knowing her. Okay, I'm almost there. Margaret has influenced each of our lives. Our tapestries, even right now, in this place, um, she's, she's still influencing your uh, tapestry. A portion of your life tapestry is being influenced by being here. We can't see it. We don't know what will change or how it'll turn out, but God does. Take a moment now, uh, in your own minds just to think about times that you've spent with Margaret. Did she make you laugh? Did she challenge you in some way? Sit quietly with you? Pray for you? Teach you? Love you for who you were? Um, did she have you over to her house? Did you have some of the uh, Margaret Murphy hospitality? 
That list goes on and each of you can add a moment and, and uh, it's your own personal thing. Each life that touches ours, no matter how briefly, will influence us. If you don't believe me, here's a question. Have you ever been frustrated by another driver on the road? When you arrived at your destination, were you in a bad mood? Ever had the person in front of you in line pay for your coffee? What did that do for your mood? Do these moods stick with you and get passed on to others? Of course they do. What's the most contagious human facial expression? A smile. Pass that on. Hard with our masks these days, but now we're smiling with our eyes. It may be a while before we see the influence of this gathering on us, but if in a few hours, days, weeks, months, we take time to reflect on this gathering in celebration of Margaret's life, we will begin to see the new threads that were added to our tapestry, the old threads that have been highlighted. Each of us has a unique involvement in Margaret's tapestry and she in ours. That one stitch or row after row of stitches will help your tapestry turn out just the way God has planned for you. We can't see clearly now, but in a while as our grief lessens, we may look back and see what new feature New color was added to our tapestry because of Margaret's celebration of life. As the weavers weave their tapestry, needles going in and out, pulling threads behind them, they're focused only on the stitch they're making. At the end of the day, as they lay down their work, they can see the picture taking shape. Today, realize that God completed the plan for Margaret's life, and he has a plan for yours. I'm reading from Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Well then, uh, Mom also got mad at me for crying as well, so I'm going to try and do my best to brave on just like you have to. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, welcome to you all. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me yet or haven't seen me for a while, my name is Jeff Murphy, uh, and I've been blessed with this opportunity to speak uh, for a few minutes about my mom and whose life we're celebrating here today together. And I realized that I said about this task that a son sees his mother in a, a very different context than those friends and even my father who's been married to my mom for over 40 years. But nonetheless, I will try to represent the shared feelings of love, devotion and admiration that we felt towards mom. My mom would be very pleased and honored to see that you all can make it here this morning to share in this with us as was her friends and family who were the most important focus to her. It was also your continued support, well wishes and prayers, which were so valuable to her in her final weeks. In addition to your presence, we have received many, many expressions of condolences from among the thousands of people 
that mom has touched over the years and your words that you use to describe mom match those that are now echoing my own head. Words like generous, selfless, and courageous. And believe even though mom's soul is now with God, her generosity, selflessness, and courage lives within us and has molded the ones she's touched the most. For example, on a weekly basis, mom would pay for the person behind her in the Tim Hortons drive through line. She volunteered for the Heart and Stroke Foundation for years and cooked and served for the less fortunate on a regular basis. And even on just this Monday, the day of mom's passing, I even felt compelled to pay for a mother's groceries when she forgot her wallet. And in writing this, I realized that that generosity was not my own, but truly molded by mom. And I know mom is up there staring down at both dad and I while we go through the Tim Hortons drive through saying, don't be cheap, boys. <laughs> and some of you may not know we lived in Yellowknife for a lot of the 90s. And uh, I played hockey like most Canadian boys. And mom would refuse to miss a game. And in the 13 years that I think I played hockey, I don't think I can count on one hand how many times she missed a game. She was there all the time. It was a great sacrifice and selflessness that she had, and especially if you think that if you imagine the 70s era Yellowknife hockey arenas in the middle of February, those are a true test of selflessness. Now her courage was the hardest to reflect on, not because there are a few examples, but because she did so many things with courage. She worked in the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton, as a nurse for over a decade, caring for palliative cancer patients. And there are fewer in this world who have the courage to dedicate their life to such a calling. And even on the day of her passing, in her final seconds of life on this earth before she met God, when she heard dad crying, she called out dad's name, opened her eyes fully and stared at dad, fearless full of love to comfort him because that's all that mattered to her. It was the most beautiful example of courage that I've ever seen. Mom's legacy of generosity, selflessness, and courage that she's shown all her life lives within us. And I'm excited to continue on that legacy with my daughters and make mom proud of the impact that they're going to make in this world because of her. I will always be extremely proud to call myself the son of Margaret Murphy. Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13 from the Passion Translation. Pray like this, our Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth, just as it is fulfilled in heaven. We acknowledge you as our provider of all we need each day. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Rescue us every time we face tribulation and set us free from evil. For you are the king who rules with power and glory forever. Amen. Families put together a slideshow uh, with some of the songs that were so important to uh, Margaret, and we'll take a look at uh, her life through some of these photos at this time.
heard there was a secret chord David played and it pleased the Lord But he don't really care for music, do ya? Well, it goes like this The fourth, the fifth, the minor fall The major left, the baffled king composed Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Well, your faith is strong, but you need it proof. Saw her bathing on the roof, her beauty and the moonlight overthrew ya. Well, she tied you to her kitchen chair, she broke your throne and cut your hair. Baby, I've been here before Seen this room I ever walked this floor I, I used to live alone Before I knew ya Then I saw your flag On the marble arch Our love is not A victory march It's cold Maybe there's a God above, but all I've ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody who outdrew ya. Well, it's not a cry that you hear at night, it's not someone who's seen the light, it's a cold.
Mesdames et Messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Lang. So neat to see the story of Margaret's life and those pictures and parts of it that uh, that I'd never seen or knew before. It was beautiful. And just as we um, conclude this celebration of her life, I also want to remind you of one more part of Margaret's life. And that the story of Margaret Murphy is not just told through pictures, but actually the story of her life can be told through how God viewed Margaret. For one thing, Margaret Murphy was known by God before she was born. Psalm 139 says, you created me in my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, O God, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Which to me says that Margaret didn't just happen. She came into this world being put together by God to make a difference in the lives of others and make a difference for God. She was a gift from God to the rest of the world. And life is the process of opening that gift. And that gift is open to enrich others. And we've heard some of how Margaret opened that gift and gave herself to us all. And the other thing that's true about Margaret is she was known and celebrated by God before she was even born. And while she was alive, God celebrated her then too. Zephaniah puts it this way, God takes great delight in you. His love will no longer rebuke you, but he rejoices over you with singing. That God celebrated what he had made when he made Margaret. That he was there in her every moment, laughing, celebrating over her. And on the day when she was a teenager and she committed her life and gave her heart back to God and she accepted his grace, God celebrated her. And God declared, this one, this Margaret, she's my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And he celebrated her wedding day and he celebrated her best days and he celebrated the day that she gave birth to her son and she celebrated, he celebrated over her when she spent time with her granddaughters. He was there. And when Margaret hurt, when relationships became difficult, when she disappointed herself and others, when life was hard and loved ones passed away, when anger and tears came, when Addison's disease came and myotonic dystrophy came, God knew and God grieved and God was with her. And when she failed God, when she blew it, when she made mistakes, in her most ungodlike moments, that's exactly when God said, I love you this much. And he remembered sending his son to die for her, that that's what she was worth to God. And that was the greatest statement that anybody could ever make about Margaret, that God would say, I will give my son for her so she can be forgiven, so that Jesus could be resurrected, so that she would never die. And he did that to declare how much Margaret was worth to him. And then when last weekend came and she moved from this world to the next, when she finally walked to the end of life's road, he was there too. 
her true father. And he ran to her and kissed her, and he celebrated with her because she went home, the home she was made for. And, and I just have this picture, imagine, if you will, with me, when Margaret took her first breath in heaven and saw Jesus face to face, what he had prepared for her. And she was welcomed, and she experienced a love that we don't even understand, and it forgave every failure. It mended hurts that only she knew. It was a love that understood everything she had been through and healed every cell in her body and satisfied every longing of her soul. What am I saying? That long before Margaret was born, before her mom and dad and teachers and friends and her husband became involved, she was God's beloved, and she is God's beloved today. He was always there. He was with her before she was born. At her best and worst, her name is written on the palm of his hand. Every hair on her head, every thought in her head was known to him, and she was safe, and she is safe with him. And that's our great hope, friends, on a day like today. That was the hope for Margaret and her life, and that's the hope for ours as well. And we need it on days like today, don't we? We need a hope like that because death challenges where, we put our, where we're putting our hopes. In this dying world of, whether it be your plants or your puppies or your loved ones, this world where things don't last, we have to go outside of this world to find a hope that's more powerful than death. And that's what Margaret found. And that's what I want to remind you of and remind you of where Margaret found it. <laughs> she really believed that there was a man named Jesus Christ who came to this earth and gave his life for her. And that when he died, he was carrying the weight of the entire world on his shoulders. And she knew that Jesus died to forgive her and that when he rose again from the grave, he was declaring that death would not have the last word for her. And so we're here today, and we can actually celebrate Margaret with hope because of what God did through Jesus. And I know that it's Margaret's desire that you would have that same hope today, maybe for the first time, maybe a renewal of your hope that you would put your trust in the one that Margaret trusted, the one who said in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So friends, I encourage you to put your hope there. And that one of the things that we know is that for Margaret, this journey is done, but she has not just gone, she's gone on ahead. And so we put our trust in the hope that we will see her and be with her once more. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your love does not end. And when all else fails, you are God and you are good. And so as your people this afternoon, we say thank you. We say thank you for Margaret, and we know that her generosity and her courage and her selflessness is just a glimpse of the one that she followed. And we thank you for all the lives that she touched, for the tapestries in this room that are different because of how she walked through this world. We thank you for the gift of her life, we thank you for the grace that you have given to her. We thank you for all that was good and kind and faithful and fun in her. And we thank you that for her, death is past, and she has entered into the joy that you have prepared for your people. We ask your comfort for Margaret's family, especially for Jeff and Caitlin and their girls, and especially for Joe today and in the days to come. We ask that your love would be very real to them, that they would experience um, a glimpse of the goodness that you have in store for them. 
in these days ahead. And we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for the comfort that only you can give. And we especially thank you for the hope that Jesus has given all of us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.